what that is in a moment. But uh, we always start uh, our days uh, at the center and wherever we work with asking people how they feel. So we, we have to do that here too. Uh, 2.30 on a Tuesday. Um, this is our mood meter. Uh, started with my colleague David Caruso who's in the room. Where are you, David? And uh, it's evolved into these four color quadrants that uh, we use to help people describe uh, their emotion states. So yellow obviously means bright, full of energy, pleasant. So let's get a round of uh, hands for who's in the yellow today, anybody? All right, that's good. Uh, green, pleasant, but a little bit lower in energy. People in the back for some reason. <laughs> uh, reminds me of my teaching days. Uh, oh, that's coming, the blue and the red is coming up. So blue and red uh, are unpleasant, not necessarily bad, but unpleasant with low energy. Anybody feeling a little, need a little pick-me-up today? We can help you out, I promise. We have some alcohol. Uh, <laughs> uh, or maybe the red, a little, had a rough day, feeling a little uptight, maybe a little nervous. Now, I could admit that today I was a little in the red. You know, woke up this morning thinking, you know, I do so many talks every year, but like this one seems to be like the most important. So if I mess up, it's purely a result of my inability to regulate my emotions. <laughs> <laughs> but we're really here today to celebrate, you know, decades of research that has been conducted here at Yale University. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we have uh, the center, we're calling the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. We kept our name really simple because what we do is we study the science and the practice of emotional intelligence. And our vision, as you can read on the screen is to use the power of emotional intelligence to create a more healthy, effective, and compassionate society. So uh, you know that we have a list of speakers today, and that's going to be the theme of our presentations, uh, to create a more healthy, effective, and compassionate society through the rigorous science and practice of emotional intelligence. And that's aligned with our mission. What we do in our center is conduct rigorous research and develop innovative educational practices and approaches to empower people of all ages with the skills they need to succeed. So in today's uh, session, we're gonna start off by having a very honored guest. Uh, so Peter Salove is here today. Uh, many of you, or I mean all of you know who he is, uh, is the new, the 23rd president of Yale University. But more importantly, he was the founder of what's called the Health Emotion and Behavior Laboratory, which is where our center grew out of. So I had the pleasure of meeting Peter over 15 years ago when I was a graduate student with his colleague, Jack Mayer. And when I left graduate school, or actually before I was gonna leave graduate school, I realized that I wanted to come here. And uh, Peter was getting really busy in his career. And uh, I was you know, using my emotional intelligence, able to sort of carve out a position for myself over 12 years ago. And uh, these have been the best 12 years of my life. So thank you, Peter. So let me introduce Peter Salovey, who's going to open our day. Thank you so much, Mark. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it is uh, wonderful to see all of you here to celebrate the opening of the, uh, the center. If I, am I going to ruin something if I close this? I'll, I'll just move it aside. Uh, and uh, Mark asked me to say a word about the origins of the idea of emotional intelligence and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the next focus uh, for research in this area and, uh, uh, and do that all in four minutes. So uh, I'm going to give it a try. Uh, first of all, before I do that, I really have to thank uh, uh, all of you for being here in different ways. In this audience are thought leaders, intellectual leaders in the area uh, of, uh, of emotion, human emotion research, emotional intelligence, school-based prevention programs, uh, uh, self-regulatory research, and the like. Uh, in this audience today are supporters of the center, those of you who have uh, supported us with your ideas and your creativity, others who've also supported us with their uh, funds, and we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, many of you are colleagues in this enterprise uh, in uh, uh, trying to uh, 
improve the lives of children and adults, improve society uh, through, in different ways, uh, the teaching of emotion-related skills. And so thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, let me, uh, I'll talk about the past and then the future. The past, you know, I, I started out in psychology as a researcher uh, in the emotions area, and we brought people to our lab and would induce them to feel different emotions. We'd play music or have them watch a film or have them recollect a childhood experience, something that would, that would allow them to feel uh, some deep emotion. And then our research was about how did that emotion affect the way they remembered things, the, what they paid attention to, how they reported physical symptoms, whether they were willing to help another person. And, uh, and then we would um, uh, you know, make, draw conclusions about the role of emotion as a motivating factor in our lives, the role of emotion in affecting thinking and the relationship between passion and reason. And that, that, that was what we were doing. And there were two things we were paying no attention to. One is the fact that we would bring all these people into our lab and we assumed that they all experienced the emotion the same way and that it would have some kind of overall impact on thinking and on behavior. But in fact, what was happening was an awful lot of individual variability. And for most of the first part of uh, my life in psychology, we thought of that as noise, right? Yeah, different people are, are, are experiencing the emotion in different ways. Some people don't even know we're inducing an emotion. Other people think we are. Uh, some people think the experiment's about something completely different. And uh, uh, Jack Mayer, a uh, colleague and friend at University of New Hampshire, he was also doing studies like this, primarily mood and memory, and also noticing lots of variability. And uh, all of a sudden, we started, suddenly started to pay attention. Maybe there's something different about those people who come into an experiment like that and, and recognize that uh, their, their emotions are being manipulated and uh, they need to do something about that versus other people who are more, let's say, uh, uh, naive in that situation. So we started to pay attention to differences among people and realizing that some had all kinds of skills uh, related to emotions and others didn't. The other uh, thing that we weren't paying any attention to at the time was that anything we were doing in the lab might have application beyond the lab. We thought of ourselves as kind of basic scientists um, uh, trying to figure out the, the nomothetic or lawful behavior of human emotions across all people. But I had professors and colleagues at the time, like Roger Weisberg, who's here today, and classmates uh, like Richard Sussman, who's here today, who have always been motivated by what can you change in the world uh, through uh, uh, the application of scientific principles and discoveries. And we would argue about this and talk about this, and I would always say, no, I'm a lab researcher. But they were the folks who first got us interested in uh, the idea that all of this may matter outside the lab and it may matter in a big and important way, and it may be these emotion skills may be the key uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, ultimately to understanding problems like bullying and problems like classroom uh, behavior and problems like friendship uh, making uh, and problems like conflict resolution and, and on and on. That didn't come from us, that came from colleagues. I think uh, uh, we first got the idea that maybe there could be an emotional intelligence that was a, represented by a set of skills about emotions that could be measured, that could be thought of like a kind of intelligence uh, that could be that people could learn and improve over the course of the li their lives, came from beginning to think about emotions uh, in individual difference terms and beyond the lab. And I think many of you have heard this story, Jack Mayer, who had become a good friend, and I were painting the first house that I owned that we, uh, with Marta, my wife. We just bought it, and we were painting, and I think he said to me, you know, uh, you know these skills, you know, maybe there's a, like an intelligence of the emotions, like an emotional intelligence. And we both kind of looked at each other and said, that's a cool term, you know, and then, uh, you know, having, having sort of said this phrase to each other, um, uh, we then 
became very motivated to trace out, well, what could that mean? What could that be? How would you define it? What are the skills? Now, it turns out we weren't the first people to ever use that phrase. It had been used in a doctoral dissertation and in a paper on literary criticism, I think in, maybe in German. But, um, uh, but we wrote a paper together at a conference uh, saying, you know, it, could there be an emotional intelligence? If so, what, what would it be? And uh, that paper uh, kind of sat there for a while, and about uh, five years later, Dan Goleman wrote his book, Emotional Intelligence, cited that paper. He had talked to us about the work, and then uh, drew lots of other implications about the work, and suddenly everybody knew about it. And, uh, and it was life-changing. And um, uh, that, that launched about 20 years of research on trying to figure out how to measure this. Okay, now we really, we said it's measurable, but we didn't have any measures. So how do you actually measure it? And, what, and then once you measure it, what do those measures predict? So, um, you know, the future, I think, is uh, in this area of uh, both measurement and application. I think our tools still feel a little rudimentary. They're good, they're, they're ability-based, they're valid, Right? But uh, they don't take uh, a lot of, um, they, they don't make a lot of use of cutting edge technology. I think that's where we can move. I think they, they'll, they will move in directions where we can actually look at people's emotional intelligence as they use those skills, not merely as they talk about using those skills, right? The, the difference, the thing, not just ideas about the thing, right? In, the, in, in how we assess emotional intelligence. And further, I think people are going to come up with all kinds of areas of application where these skills turn out to matter and are gonna uh, look for ways to cultivate those skills, inculcate those skills in those contexts. Obviously school's a big place. Uh, obviously workplaces for adults, uh, a huge um, focus for emotional intelligence research. Uh, now bullying uh, in, uh, you know, on the playground and in neighborhoods and in schools, a big focus of activity. Where's next? I think. Uh, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's limitless, really. Finally, I think the last area of research uh, is going to pay more attention to cultural, culture and cultural differences. I think uh, emotions are one of those places where uh, uh, people from different parts of the world um, uh, at least represent their emotions a little differently, understand the emotional consequences of situations a little differently, and then that's the place where cultural misunderstandings are most likely uh, to occur. So, you know, uh, th this is a bigger talk for another day, but those are some of the areas where I think we're, we're all going to move. And, but I am just so thankful uh, that uh, really, through the influence of others, uh, we suddenly started to pay attention to individual variability and suddenly started to pay attention to real people in the real world whose emotions uh, matter. Um, so, turns out I now have another job. And that other job is Yale's next president. I'm actually inaugurated a week, a week from this weekend, uh, although I've been uh, serving in that job since July 1st, uh, takes me out of the lab. And even though I love all of this work, I can't do it in the same way that I used to. I'm, I won't be completely gone from it. But I will, it won't be a day-to-day -day part of my life the way it once was. However, it is enormously gratifying to me uh, that Mark and Susan and the team are uh, uh, redeveloping uh, and repositioning uh, the, this center at this moment in order to carry on this tradition of emotional intelligence research uh, at Yale. The word that psychologists like to use is generativity. There's nothing more gratifying than the feeling that, not that you're necessarily doing it yourself, but that somehow you have helped the next generation also do it. And of course, they pass it on to the next generation and it's a geometric proportion of some kind. So soon, the entire world is doing emotional intelligence research, right? It only takes a few generations. Anyway, that kind of generativity is enormously gratifying to me and I'm so thrilled uh, that the team is here. Uh, to celebrate with all of our uh, guests uh, uh, and uh, this next phase in the life of um, EI uh, 
research uh, here at Yale University. Thank you all very much for being here, and thank you for giving me a few minutes to kick it off. Thank you. All right, so we can all go home now. <laughs> We've heard it. Um, thank you, Peter. That was inspiring. Uh, and we do hope to do, obviously, the service uh, that you want us to do for the university. The, uh, we're going to move on now to our speakers. Uh, just what happens, I'm your first speaker, so you've got you to stick with me for a few minutes. But um, if these are our speakers today. We have uh, Dr. Ed Seidemann from NYU and the W.T. Grant Foundation. Roger Weisberg from UIC and Castle, and people from our own center, Susan Rivers and Diana Devecha. We have a friend and colleague from Facebook, Arturo Bajar, and Zorana also from our center. What I wanted to do is give you a little bit more of the science, uh, the details of the work that we've been doing uh, for the last uh, at least 12 years that I've been working here. And uh, the goal that I have really is to just put the work that we have done in context for all of you. Essentially, the idea behind emotional intelligence is that emotions matter, and that's why the title of our presentation is Emotions Matter. And we have done research for the last decade, and even obviously before the last decade in other laboratories around the world, in these four primary areas, which demonstrate the power and influence of emotions on four things, such as attention, memory, and learning. Uh, the work we do in schools is particularly important in this area given the challenges that kids face with anxiety over test taking or maybe fear in terms of bullying. Uh, decision making and judgment. Just for curiosity, has anyone here uh, made a bad decision lately? <laughs> anyone? It's okay, you know, it's all right. Um, many of us think that our, you know, our cognition drives our, our thinking, but what we now know from our research is that emotions drive much of the decision making we, we do. Uh, by way of example, we just published a paper looking at educators and showing that diff mood states, different mood states, happy, sad, um, shifted the way teachers think about their students. And literally, um, grades were different um, when teachers were in sad versus happy mood states. So the objectivity of grades, we have to think more clearly about. Relationship quality. I mean, I always say, how many of you enjoy being around the angry, disgruntled colleague? Does anybody like look forward to that? <laughs> and you think, oh my goodness, like, like, she's so mean and he's so nasty. Like, I'm going to see if he wants to go for coffee. <laughs> Typically, we stay away from people who are not well regulated, who don't demonstrate positive emotions. And finally, uh, physical and mental health is a big interest of ours. Uh, even moving into clinical psychology, looking at the role of emotional intelligence in depression and anxiety. So, as Peter mentioned, uh, we are very fortunate that Peter and, and Jack uh, were doing that painting back in the late 1980s. Uh, because historically, you can see here, passion and reason were seen as antithetical. And in ancient Greece, there was talk about ruling your feelings or they'll rule you. Uh, this reminds me of a recent cab ride. I was coming back from the airport, and uh, this taxi the driver of the car service said, you know, what do you do? I said, I study this thing called emotional intelligence. And he goes, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> and it was funny that he said that. He goes, intelligent about your emotions? That doesn't make any sense. And I said, well, there's this thing called emotional intelligence, and it actually matters, and it has these skills. And in the last few years, we've sort of come up with a, an acronym to describe these skills, and we use the word ruler to help describe them. These discrete set of skills of recognizing emotion and face and body and voice, understanding where these emotions come from and how they influence our thinking and behavior, giving that vocabulary so that we can describe ourselves in ways that are meaningful, expressing emotions in this appropriate way, as Peter alluded to in his talk. The idea of culture matters a lot for this piece because there are rules in different cultures for how and when we express emotions. We need to be mindful of that. And certainly, uh, how many of you feel that your lives would be somewhat more effective if you had a richer toolbox of emotion regulation strategies? Nobody? Come on. <laughs> how about if I live with you? Uh, <laughs> Or maybe I should ask you, how many of you think your lives would be better if everyone who you live with had more strategies? <laughs> your hands would go up? Yeah. This is America. We want everyone else to develop themselves. So as Peter also mentioned, our, a, big center of our, a big center of our center now is on the measurement of emotional intelligence. And 
People have been trying to do this for, for the last two decades, and three primary ways that people have thought about it. You can ask the person directly. So I'm going to ask you to do this for a moment. I'd like you to just take a moment and look at your neighbor. Just look at them. And answer the following question. How much more emotionally intelligent are you than that person? <laughs> yeah. So I did a study on this, I don't know, about seven or eight years ago with my students, my undergraduate students here at Yale. And 80% of my students said they were more emotionally intelligent than their friends. <laughs> For those of you who know about probability, it doesn't work out. You can also ask people. And uh, we won't get into the details of that, but you know, when people are judging you, uh, they're typically judging your behavior, not so they can get inside your head and know your skill set, uh, like emotional intelligence. Finally, the way we focused on it in our center is using performance assessment tools. We want to know what people actually do with their emotions and measure it, for example, using uh, facial expressions, uh, having people judge people's facial expressions versus t asking or telling uh, or asking them to report how skilled they are in this area. And what we found <clears throat> in our research is that self-knowledge is really limited in this area. People tend to overestimate their emotional intelligence. Um, and it doesn't seem to predict much when you ask people about their emotional intelligence. When you measure it using self-report instruments, like asking people, are you emotionally intelligent? Or do you regulate your emotions well? They don't, that assessment doesn't seem to correlate with important life outcomes. But when you find out how well people problem solve about their emotions, you seem to get much better findings. And we're moving in a much more technologically savvy way of measuring that. Actually, last week we spent some time in San Francisco working with a game developer, really thinking critically about how to use technology to measure facial expressions, and we're excited to release that soon. I want to wrap up my presentation by just saying that we've studied the heck out of emotional intelligence in the last 10 years, really looking at children and adults. And what we know about students with higher emotional intelligence is important things. First, as you can see, they have less anxiety. Actually, you can't see, oh, you can't see it, good. Uh, they tend to report having lower depression, tend to be less involved in the use of illegal substances or abuse, abusing substances in middle and high school, tend to be less aggressive and less likely to bully others, have greater relationship and leadership skills, less hyperactive, more attentive in school, and obviously what's important in today's nation is they perform better academically. So the skills matter. We moved on to study teachers. And what we found among teachers is that they also uh, are just more positive in their work. <coughs> they receive more support from the principals in their schools. And finally, they report greater job satisfaction and less burnout. Some of the more interesting research that Susan will talk more about today is we've moved beyond the study of the individual's emotional intelligence to the study of the emotionally intelligent environment. And we've co collaborated with um, other researchers in these assessment tools that measure the emotional climate or the emotional intelligence of a setting or a classroom. And what we found is that when you measure that using videotaped analysis, we find that classrooms that are rated as having more emotional intelligence have students who are more engaged, have students who um, report having better quality relations with their teachers, increase pro-social behavior, and perform better academically. With my colleague David Caruso and others, we've looked at emotional intelligence in the workplace. And I won't go into the details of this, but you can see here that uh, managers with higher emotional intelligence seem to have better outcomes, teams with higher emotional intelligence. And David and I did a study uh, a number of years ago where we had 100 um, managers take the emotional intelligence test called the Mesquite that David co-developed with Peter and Jack Mayer. And then we had the CEO of the company say, if you would do anything, or uh, if you were going to leave this company tomorrow, what would you do to bring each of these people with you? And what we found was the strongest correlate of in the entire study was this variable, that the managers with higher emotional intelligence were those individuals that the CEOs wanted to be with. So everybody asks you know, about the development of emotional intelligence. It's a nature-nurture debate that we're going to continuously study in our center. Um, but what we do feel is that if we can give children an education from preschool through high school, uh, we can get those outcomes that we're all interested in, which have to do with greater social competence, higher quality performance, and certainly better health. Now, I ask all of you, how much formal education have you had in emotional intelligence? Don't all jump up and down. Uh, 
How many of you believe that you had a really strong education and emotional intelligence? Raise your hand. We have one person who sort of half raised her hand. So there's hope. We have a career. It's good news for us, Susan. Um, the other point, and we're going to get into this now, is what are the concrete tools you know, that our educators and um, teachers have to, to make sure that every child gets that emotion education. So I'm going to stop here because I want to make sure that our presenters get the time they need to do the work uh, and share their work. But uh, I'll lastly say the following, that um, we are delighted to have Ed Seidemann here. Where are you, Ed? Uh, about five years ago, uh, Susan and I wrote a grant uh, proposal to the William T. Grant Foundation that really changed our lives. We uh, needed to show definitively that our approach to teaching social and emotional learning mattered. And uh, we took a risk and we wrote this humongous grant proposal for a lot of money. And uh, we were very fortunate that Ed Seidemann and his colleagues read that proposal and thought that what we had to say was worthwhile. So Ed is not only a professor at NYU, but has been with the William T. Grant Foundation for years, and I'm just delighted to have Ed come up and share his work on setting level outcomes for youth. Thank you, Ed. So I'm uh, delighted to be here. Oh, uh, is there a place you can stand with? <laughs> Unfortunately uh, not. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to uh, be here uh, to uh, anoint this new center and commend the years of uh, emotional intelligence, basic research, and laboratory stuff. But I'm, I'm uh, at, at the individual level, and I say that because I'm going to push where you guys ended to the social setting level. Uh, but I want to diverge for a moment because I don't know if Peter's still here or not, uh, but he is. But I know Peter probably longer than anybody here because I was at the University of Illinois and. I think I was probably running graduate admissions at the time, uh, and Peter was an applicant for graduate school. That tells you how young he is and how old I am. But, uh, uh, and so he applied, and I don't remember the exact order, but he had a, a BA and an MA from Berkeley and Stanford and a shitload of publications, one in psychology and sociology. And the joke was, let's hire this guy as a tenured associate professor. <laughs> Well, he didn't come to Illinois and he went to Yale. I then moved to New York. Uh, and I was still on leave and I went back and because uh, my daughter still lived there. And uh, there was a party for Peter because he was interviewing for a job <laughs> at Illinois. And once again, he turned Illinois down and stayed at Yale. And that's all your great fortune uh, uh, that he's here. And so it's, I've watched his career closely over the years and it's not at all surprising that he's your next president. So, and I commend you on that great choice. Uh, oh. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of social settings uh, and that's sort of the outline and to, to move fast I will not go through the outline. Um, so uh, the overarching issues for a science of social settings center around a couple areas that we really need to talk about theory, how to improve theory, what we know about theory, and the same goes for measurement, intervention, and design and analysis. Um, and so one of the questions is what is a social setting? How do social settings operate? How do social settings differ from other units of observation, both smaller and larger in scope and complexity? In terms of measurement kind of issues that we need to progress on, it's how can we measure the complexity of social setting features and processes? You're going to hear some about how the ruler group has been doing that, uh, especially with regard to the temporal nature, uh, as well as the multiple participants within them and their dynamic interaction. And we really haven't gotten a handle on those things. There's a lot of methodological tools out there to do it, but we haven't done that very well. Some people have done that in family interaction, but that's about the extent where that's gone. Um, are there cla are classic instruments and methods uh, of measurement up to the challenge? If not, how do they need to, need to differ? Uh, in terms of intervention, can social settings be intentionally created or altered? Have critical strategies needed to alter social settings been identified? Can changes in social settings, I lost the rest of my words, uh, make a difference? Uh, and then in, in analysis, be, you, design and analysis becomes a whole different issue because how do design issues differ 
when social settings are the unit of assignment as opposed to individuals, and how, are the, and how does the focus of intervention change? Uh, at the foundation, uh, we tried to articulate a little bit about a social setting theory that other people have done, Raldenbush has done, Pianta has done. They're all very sort of similar, but we were, because we were at a foundation, we were trying to have a generic kind of thing that would fit with lots of people. And social settings are really the proximal places where people have their daily experiences. Classrooms, schools, uh, community-based organizations, workplaces, families. So that's what we were trying to give a conceptual, a loose conceptual framework for. Uh, and we talked about resources here, can be economic resources, uh, human resources, physical resources, uh, and then the composition or distribution of resources, how those are arranged in a classroom or a workplace. And then the other part is sort of social regularities, which I'm going to focus a lot on. All of these things affect youth outcomes. Those, that's inside the black box, inside the social setting. That's what goes on. And how do they then in turn affect youth outcomes? And they're interactive with each other. But what we really postulated is a lot of policy things try to change resources, okay? But unless you change the daily experience or the daily regularities that a kid experiences, you're probably not going to get the changes you desire. So, uh, so that's sort of a, a loose conceptualization that, that we've laid out uh, about uh, that. And the social regularities in there are really the interactions, the transactions, the practices, the routines, and the norms. As Mark talked about the environment, so what's the emotional and intelligent environment? What's really the norm? Can you look at that and look at it by looking at the interactions between teachers and students if we just stay with classrooms? Can you look at it by looking at the social climate of the classroom, the norms about aggression or the norms about emotions? Uh, so, so that's a, an important place to look. Um, and, and, uh, and the, con the, com the usual ways that they're measured are behavioral observations, which have been around for a long time. Norm measurement has also been around for a long time. Norms have been measured by self-reports or artifacts. Uh, but often norms are measured in very inappropriate ways. Uh, most of the, the norm measurement have been, you take an aggregate of individuals uh, and then you say this class has this kind of norm versus the other class. But norms are really talking about the distribution of norms in the class. If you're guessing for self-reports, you've got to look at the homogeneity of it. If, because the, no, the norm is the average, and the average is not pertinent unless you've got some fair homogeneity. So if you have a wide bell-shaped distribution in the class, it's really telling you more about individual variance. So there are methodological ways of dealing with those things that are important. Social networks are coming more and more into looking at the patterns of exclusion or inclusion of different people in the classroom is another way of tapping social regularities. And social regularities is a concept that I really built on Seymour Saracen's notions of behavioral and programmatic regularities. I call them social as those the behavioral because behavioral puts them back in the individual. It has the meta communication of putting them back in the individual when it's really between people. Uh, and that's, that's the key for that. Um, so uh, the big picture, you could see that the settings could be the classrooms or schools or the family peers. There are macro forces that are affecting those that were we're not really capable of studying those very well. There's macro forces uh, or micro forces that might moderate the relationship between the classroom and schools. Uh, and, you know, but the, the key thing is that the, that the social settings uh, may, may be mediating what's going on in youth outcomes when you look inside uh, the classrooms. Um, so and in order to do a lot of this research, it was really because the time was sort of right in terms of design and data analysis, uh, people like Raldenbush and Sampson and Shin and, and Rapkin really talked about uh, really what's ecometrics. So instead of studying psychometrics, which is about the individual, how do, you do, how do you do research and do measurement about the ecology of a setting? Uh, so those were important things. HLM came along with Brick and Raldenbush, and that really helps to look at multiple levels of analysis at the same time and their interactions. Only five minutes. Uh, optimal design software came around, which really l allows you to assess the power that you need in a study, and the power is very different when you have kids nested in classrooms, nested in schools over time. So there was a lot of methodological work that helped us on that. Uh, in terms of measuring social regularities uh, in, the, in the classroom, uh, 
new and, and very rigorous instruments like the classroom assessment scoring system came around uh, and similar kinds of measures more at the level of culture uh, that use the kinds of uh, uh, looking at homogeneity of measures in, in child welfare settings and in, in clinics was uh, some of uh, Charles Glisson's work on the organization of the social context measure. Uh, and so what, what social, what, what have we, uh, did I skip one? No, too busy. Uh, so uh, in, in the recent innovations in the interventions to really restructure, change the regularities of the settings, uh, there have been, in the last decade, there have been a variety of really exciting programs that have actually not just looked at the outcomes at the kid level, but what's going on, how are you changing the classroom to foster promotion and prevention, and what are the, how are you changing the regularities, and, in, and, and doing, these are all randomized control trials in different areas. You see at the top is the emotional intelligence and the ruler. Uh, which is a, a really particularly important one, not just because it's here, but because of the work they did. They, they really did, uh, it was a brilliant insight that Mark and Susan and Peter had of really, it's not just the kids, we gotta teach the teachers, and if we're teaching the teachers and the, and the principal staff, what's going on in the environment that's mediating that? And that's really, it's, it's those interactions and transactions that are critical, and you can't just look at the outcomes if you wanna understand. It won't help you do better prevention because then you're just doing one kid at a time or one teacher at a time. How do you change the structure of the setting? And all these projects in different ways are examples of it. The ones that are up there are ones that we funded at the foundation, uh, but there are a number of others too. Uh, so, uh, how much time do I have left? Two minutes, okay. Uh, so, the, the, the lessons that we learned, uh, sorry, page got out of order. Uh, the social settings lessons that we've learned. We, so about theory, I raised a bunch of questions. We really uh, now have some common frameworks for research and intervention on social settings. And, and we really know that we can study social settings. We can go beyond the individual, we can study them. And as I've indicated already, there are a number of advances that are occurring. In terms of intervention, all those projects I put up there really made significant difference in kids' lives and they were mediated by the, the changing social regularities. So the setting change is possible, and that's a much more powerful level, locus of intervention than just trying to inoculate individuals and change individuals. Uh, and that kind of change has much more preventive and promotive scope to it. And in a lot of those studies that I didn't go through in detail, sort of the amount of coaching and feedback of the daily practitioners are really critical. Because in classrooms, as in other work settings, people are left alone. They don't get the help and need, and they need very concrete help about the daily things they're doing. And so we need to find systems to ma make that happen. Uh, in terms of measurement, uh, the, the generalizability studies have been applied now to behavioral observation measures. And again, uh, Susan and Mark and, and colleagues have done some key studies on showing how to look at generalizability. It's not easy to get reliability in a setting level measure, and it's a different kind of set of methodological issues. Um, as I talked about before, there's now consensus measures when you're measuring norms, and those need to be brought to bear and not simply take the average and compare the average, because it's, it's quite misleading. Uh, and in terms of analysis, uh, there's now power calculations uh, I forget what Howard Bloom, what the new optimal design extra thing is called, but I'm forgetting the name, but his, his sort of taking that so that you can really uh, not just do the randomized cluster designs, but different levels of nestings and, and with estimates of effect size in there, and that's on the WT Grant website. Uh, so that's another useful device. Um, in terms of future challenges and conundrums, uh, in terms of theory, we still need to embed social setting theory into a, into a researchable system theory, which talks not just about the classroom or the workplace, but how are the multiple sort of Bronfenbrenner levels of analysis impacting that? How is policy impacting that? And we don't really have good notions of doing that, particularly when it comes to measuring and studying those things. But everything is nested within something else. So if you take, when you go from individuals to settings, you can go to systems too. And that, so those are areas of growth areas for us. In intervention, uh, 
you know, we still need to find more ways to restructure setting level reg regularities. Uh, we need to explore other kind of regulatory mechanisms and the first one I showed you, uh, time's out, uh, uh, where you had policy. So the question is how does this policy moderating some of these interactions that go on settings by different policies? So not just looking at the resources, but how do different policies moderate different outcomes? Uh, and, uh, and there's a, a huge need to develop reliable, valid, practical, and cost-effective instruments. The class, which is a great instrument, is far too costly because the power of something like class is when it can get down where pedagogical personnel are doing it themselves and feeding it back to themselves. And that becomes a coaching vehicle. So we have to get out of measures that are more like what we would do in the lab and more useful in the real world. Uh, and as I said before, we need measures to top the dynamic transactional patterns like stochastic models, but how do we do that? And we haven't really made much progress there. Uh, but those are challenges for the future. And the same in terms of analysis, uh, while there are some uh, attempts to do causal mediation, you really can't, in an experimental way, test causality, uh, you know, because you know, the, the mediator is not randomly assigned. So, that there's, so there's a lot of work going on in statistics and uh, to try to figure out better ways of, of tapping those kinds of things. Uh, so let me just end with one just final note, uh, which is a, a cautionary note. Uh, and, you know, while I, as I said in the beginning, the, the work on emotional intelligence has been sort of groundbreaking and critical, uh, but I worry a little when I saw I got interviewed for what the name should be. Uh, and I got a little upset when I saw it was emotional intelligence because it's the concern is the meta communication. And is that going to make everybody, the public, and other researchers think it's less, it, it's vested in the individual? It's an individual trait variable. And is that going to keep you from moving on to push the settings and systems and understand the power of those? So I will stop there. Thank you. So just so you know, there's going to be a workshop tonight on setting level irregularities. Uh, and uh, the, uh, we brought that here to make sure that you realize that we're doing rigorous research, as you can see. Um, any questions for, uh, for Ed? Well, we're gonna move uh, quickly through our, to our next presentation, but one of the things that I wanted to make sure you know is that afterwards, we're gonna be outside, and please, after, if you heard a speaker that you wanna ask questions to, please do so. Thanks again, Ed. Sure. So basically, our next speaker marries, I think, the, we, we, we put Roger third, Roger Weisberg, who is the president of CASEL, which stands for the Collaborative, uh, kidding, thank you very much, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, something I've been part of for about 10 years now that I can't remember. Uh, Roger uh, is a professor, the Novo Endowed professor uh, at the University of Illinois uh, at Chicago, but uh, as president of CASEL has really uh, made social and emotional learning and the work we do on emotional intelligence create sort of the zeitgeist, or it's created the zeitgeist that we need to make real change. So Ed talked about policy, you know, does that moderate? Well, Roger and his team is really trying to push policy to make uh, social and emotional learning part of every child's education. So I'm not gonna give, you, give away his presentation, but I'm delighted that uh, when my uncle and I wrote our first book on social and emotional learning, um, I asked Roger to take a look at, look at it, and he goes, you guys are really onto something. So uh, I still read that blur before I go to bed at night. <laughs> and welcome. So I played this fun intellectual game in preparing for this talk. I saw that there was a focus on past, present, and future of emotional intelligence, and I wondered, so if I don't know what's going to be said, and I talk about the past, present, and future of social and emotional learning, will we have anything in common with what we say? And interestingly enough, from Peter's presentation and Mark's presentation, there is absolutely no overlap <laughs> with the past, but there is incredible convergence in the future. So that's what I want to say a few words about. First, congratulations to Mark and Susan 
and your team. Uh, this is really exciting and groundbreaking that there is a center on emotional intelligence at Yale. And um, you have your vision, um, which is comparable, because I have a vision for you guys as well. Um, I think, and, and since this is a scientific symposium, I'll put it in the form of a hypothesis. Uh, I have hypothesized that your work is going to transform education from preschool to high school. I hypothesize that you're going to help develop people who are more competent and fulfilled as family members, as workers, and as citizens. I hypothesize, along with your vision, that we're going to contribute to a healthy, effective, and compassionate world. So do I think you can do everything? No. I don't. I don't think you can do anything to improve the functioning of Congress right now. That's something <laughs> I, I don't think you can do. So yeah, if you can do that, you can do any, everything. OK. So uh, to talk about the past for a second, uh, you should understand that I have very strong connections to Yale and New Haven. Uh, my, my children, my daughter, who's 26, and my son, who's 22, were born at Yale New Haven Hospital. Uh, my daughter went to Yale and graduated in 2010 and then became a Yale China Fellow and now lives in Dali, China. Uh, so there's the strong uh, family connection that I have here. And then this is Kirtland Hall, the Department of Psychology, and I was in the, uh, an office in Kirtland Hall, uh, uh, room 215, for 10 years. And, um, and the first class I ever taught, uh, developmental psychopathology, there are two students today who are in that class. One is Richard Sussman, who Peter mentioned earlier, and the other is Peter Salovey. Uh, and this, so this is before emotional intelligence ever was thought about and before social and emotional learning was ever uh, thought about. And, um, uh, and I could spend the rest of my time just talking maybe about Peter in certain ways. Uh, Peter uh, and I played softball together for many years. I don't know if many of you know that he was the pitcher on the Yale psychology softball team. <laughs> that was the intramural champion uh, in my last year in 1992 here. Um, so um, uh, what it, where does my history go, though? And again, one of the things I want to emphasize is the history is based at Yale in many important ways. But I'm going to talk about a couple of different people. Uh, because there are giants. And we build our work, our careers, on the work of giants. And one of those giants is Ed Ziegler. OK? Uh, another giant is Jim Comer, and another giant is Seymour Saracen. And these three incredible, incredible human beings uh, really, I think, and I'm just going to give a quick sentence or two about each of them, but just completely transformed the way I think about all this work, uh, and I think the way the field thinks about the work. So Ed Ziegler, um, uh, who taught me about the importance of policy with the Bush Center, for child development and social policy. Also, when we were funded by William T. Grant Foundation many years ago to have a consortium on the school-based promotion of social competence, it used to be called social competence, uh, Ed had been doing work in that field for about 30 years. And when I told him about funding to have this consortium, he said, this is great. We have to bring together, and it's from the time, Bill Bennett on the right and Mario Cuomo on the left, and let's have a meeting and bring them all together um, to get bipartisan support for this agenda. Um, and that was powerful. The idea of federal state policy to influence this work has been a major theme of some of the things we've done with CASEL. The, uh, Jim Comer, I remember as a randomized control researcher going and bringing him a program that I had worked on, and he said to me, you know, you're shifting deck chairs around on that Titanic if you're only talking about a program because it's important to think about school planning and management teams, and it's important to think about the connection to mental health, and it's important to think about parents and community members and how they're going to be involved in this process. So you hear this and say, oh my god, we've got to integrate all that into the work that we're doing. And then Seymour Saracen, um, I was a William T. Grant faculty scholar, actually, and Seymour was my mentor. Um, and we used to go out to Clark's and have uh, French fries sometimes, you know, together. And, uh, Seymour wrote a book called The Culture of the School and the Problems of Change, which was just a remarkable book about how hard this work is. And um, 
uh, in two, 1988, I was asked, I was doing these randomized control trials, and then New Haven wanted to go system-wide, K-12, to with a social development program, and they asked me and Jim Comer to work with them and consult on that. And, um, you know, this was a dramatic change in potentially in my career, and I talked with Seymour about it as my mentor, and he said, you know, I think you've learned just about everything you're ever going to learn from randomized control trials. Let other people do that. If you work system-wide in New Haven, you're going to learn answers to questions, and you don't even know what the questions are yet. And I suggest you go where you can learn. So I did that, and I, the, the learning experience was fantastic over time. So these three great giants who have really influenced, I think, a lot of how we think about the work and where the work should go. Um, uh, the other thing that I'll just say quickly, uh, part of my work was always in Kirtland Hall, but part of it was out in the New Haven schools, and this is Fairhaven Middle School, one of the schools where we worked, and another person who really was influential in my uh, career, still influential, is Tim Shriver, who's another Yale uh, uh, graduate, who um, was the supervisor of social development in New Haven, and at Fairhaven Middle School also was someone named Carol DeFalco, the best teacher I ever saw teaching social problem solving, social competence promotion work ever. Um, and what she convinced me of was the real action, if you're going to do school-based work, is at the level of the teacher. Okay, Everything else is surrounding the teacher, but how the teacher interacts with kids every day, how the teacher interacts with um, the, the uh, family is incredibly, incredibly powerful, and we have to create conditions where they can do that work and do it effectively. So um, I was interested for a while in uh, social competence promotion, and this is a problem-solving stoplight that I actually did research on for about 15 years, testing different kinds of program models. You'll see a lot of emotional intelligence in there, a lot of social development in there. But this was at the program level, and over time, um, I became more interested in just the broader set of questions that were important. And part of that were how do schools and families and communities work together to promote positive behavior in kids? Uh, how do you integrate academic, social, and emotional learning from preschool through high school? And how does that lead to academic success? But let's not forget about the important variables of healthy students and, and students with good social relationships and students who are engaged citizens and good workers. That's the uh, educating people to get into college is one thing, educating them to be great 40-year-olds is another thing. And we want both in this work. So CASEL is an organization we're about to celebrate our 20th uh, anniversary. It was founded by Dan Goldman when he was writing Emotional Intelligence and, and uh, Eileen Rockefeller Growall and uh, Tim Shriver. And uh, they said emotional intelligence, it's a different way of being smart. It can be taught. Schools should do it in evidence-based ways. And there should be an organization committed to making this work effectively. And that was what CASEL was all about. Uh, and somehow they talked me into coming in taking over, uh, which I've been doing for about 18 years now. So CASEL has an emphasis on advancing the science of social and emotional learning, uh, expanding evidence-based practice, and working on to change policy in a variety of ways. Our competencies focus on, you know, as we've thought about the work on um, promotion of um, uh, self-awareness and self-management, focus on the self, social awareness and relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So if you know yourself, can manage yourself, have empathy for others, have good relationships with others, make good decisions about yourself and others, you're going to be in pretty good shape in life. And the main message is that uh, this can be taught uh, with positive impact. Um, we did a big meta-analysis. Again, a lot comes back to the William T. Graham Foundation. They funded us to um, do this work. And um, we looked at 213 studies in social and emotional development and found, uh, colleagues of mine and I, and found that if you have a wholesome learning environment and you promote social and emotional skills in kids, you can improve their attitudes, you can improve their pro-social behavior, reduce conduct problems and emotional distress, and most importantly in this study, we found a positive impact on achievement test score performance when you focus on social and emotional development. This is not to say that it's a magic bullet. In fact, I think the big contribution of this study in some ways was just to get people to think about this integration more and the power of emotional intelligence and social and emotional skills with academic outcomes. 
There's other work that focuses on the benefits of this work to teachers, and that's so important in the ruler work that is done. Uh, when we worked with teachers, they said not only is it good for the kids, but I learned to use problem solving in my own life or I can communicate better with students, or I can deal with my own stress better. So if there's a twofer, if there's a benefit for the students and the teachers, this work can be of great power, and we need to do that. Uh, some of our findings when we looked at outside researchers doing work in schools or teachers doing the work, there's more consistent positive findings when, kids, uh, when teachers do the work. Um, uh, CASEL takes on tasks that nobody in their, you know, would take on. Really, that's really our job description. So some of this involves um, uh, things like the meta-analysis. Some involves working to set standards for the field, like RULER is what we call a CASEL Select program. We, we don't have our own programs. We review other programs, look at the impact uh, that they have, the scientific evidence to support their efficacy, the professional development that they provide, the design of the programming, and we identify a variety of programs that may be helpful. We look at programs, but then at a certain point, we said, oh, no, 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 it's not the programs that are important. It's the school-wide work that's important. So about for the last seven years, we've been looking at what it means to do school-wide systemic programming, not just in the classroom, but throughout the school in every phase of school to promote kids' social, emotional, and academic development. Then we said, well, schools are okay, and this, I guess, goes to a lot of the things that Ed's talking about, but you really need to do work at the district level if you're going to have impact across the country. So we're, right now, uh, we're funded by Novo Foundation, Einhorn Foundation, and a few other funders to think about uh, uh, doing systemic district work in eight large urban districts. Uh, uh, Anchorage, Alaska, Austin, Texas, Cleveland, Chicago, Nashville, Oakland, Sacramento, uh, Washoe County uh, are places where we're doing work, and the work's being evaluated by the American Institutes for Research in terms of impact on practice as well as student outcomes. Well, for people to do this work, you need state policy, and we, uh, in uh, 2000, it's interesting because we've done a scan of all 50 states. At the preschool level, every state all 50 states have social and emotional development standards. K to 12, very few do. We worked with the state of Illinois to develop social and emotional learning standards as part of the student learning standards uh, in Il Illinois. And now uh, Pennsylvania recently has adopted uh, standards. Kansas has adopted standards. So there's more work being done in this area. Uh, and then finally, uh, we work on federal policy, so there's something called the Academic Social and Emotional Learning Act that can provide uh, teacher and uh, administrator support. Um, so as we think about this work and the alignment, we really are thinking, how do we have effective work in the classroom? But as we think about it, we think about good programs, we think about school-wide work, district-wide work, uh, we think about uh, state and federal policy, that alignment. So now we come to the future. So in the future, uh, there are certain things that we uh, are uncertain about, like where education is going to take place and how it's going to be delivered and how technology is going to affect things. But I think at the same time, uh, we know that uh, there are certainties. Um, uh, relationships uh, matter uh, for personal and social well-being. Emotions influence learning. Social and emotional skills can be taught, and SEL requires support on many levels. Um, my final comments, uh, again, if I were to sum up, social and emotional skills are essential for personal and professional success. Social and emotional skills can be taught. SEL programs are highly uh, beneficial. SEL requires support on many levels. And then finally, a group of committed <laughs> Uh, individuals can transform education and improve the lives of millions of children. So this is where we end up, uh, Peter's overview and my overview, in the same place, I think. I think the past, you could uh, acknowledge different people who have gotten us to where we are today. But the future, I think, is with the center very much. I think the work that you guys are going to do is critically important. Um, and it's going to be very influential in multiple ways. So I'm so uh, pleased and honored that you invited me here uh, to, to congratulate you. And I would end uh, with this uh, quote from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build the youth for our future. And my hope, my vision, 
is that these two kids someday come to work for the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence <laughs> and help to advance the work uh, that you guys are really launching in very important ways. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. So we're going to save questions for the end, but I think we should, can I ask everyone to just stand up for about 10 seconds? Let's get a little movement in our bodies. You know that emotional intelligence develops with movement? Stretch out a little bit, give yourself, you know, a little bit of whatever you need to just... Can't run out there, we're going to lock the doors. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, you can have a seat. You might take a nice inhale. Let's just refresh your, your self. So our next presenter is someone that you've heard, uh, whose, whose name you've heard quite a bit today, uh, and that's Susan Rivers. Susan Rivers uh, has been my, we call each other our work wife and work husband uh, for the last 10 years. And uh, together we've built this center, and together we've done uh, probably around 50 or 60 studies that have been published uh, on both emotional intelligence and our signature program at our center that we call Ruler. So I'm delighted to just bring Susan up so she can share with you some of the pieces of Ruler and also the results of the studies that we've done. Thank you all. So Mark and I are so on the same page. I was going to start with everyone standing, but now that he's done that for me, thank you for anticipating the needs of me in the audience. Um, I just have to say that I am overwhelmed to be in front of all of you. And um, see, I'm controlling my emotions. Um, and to follow the giants in my career, Roger and Ed and Peter and Mark. So imagine a world where children enter school feeling safe, welcome, and cared for. Where children develop all self-awareness, empathy, and sound decision-making skills. Imagine a world where children are supported by their families, schools, and communities. A place where children are engaged, lifelong learners. And where children learn how to participate constructively in a democratic society and are able to achieve their full potential. With that vision in mind, we developed RULER. It's an evidence-based program for integrating emotional intelligence education into schools. This builds on a legacy of emotional intelligence research, a legacy of work that Roger and his colleagues have done, and that Marvin Moore had started back in the 60s. When we started, we, Marvin was a teacher and he brought the uh, feeling words for little children, little people, to his students in one classroom. When I started collaborating with Mark, we, there was a book, and so we brought this book to teachers in classrooms, and we said, this is what our children need. Teach, the, teach this curriculum, teach these lessons to the kids. And we gave them this well-structured book with lessons and steps, and we walked away, and we failed miserably. And what we realized was, that just having a set of lessons or a protocol isn't enough. The adults and the teachers need these skills too. They need to know how to model effective emotion regulation for their children. They need to know how to recognize the emotional expressions in their children's face when they're feeling lonely or hopeless or excited or curious. And we were ignoring the adults. And so we brought the program to teachers. We created comprehensive professional development for the teachers in schools. And we gave it to them and we sat back and we watched how amazing this was going to be and we failed again because we didn't develop the leaders or the administrators of those schools. And so we went back to the drawing board and quite frankly we teach administrators the same way we teach preschoolers, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> so we now um, have a program, an approach that integrates emotional intelligence education into all aspects of a school, to all of the adults who interact with children throughout the day from the administrators to the teachers to the staff members, the support staff, and the family members from preschool through high school. We interact with them through trainings, through professional learning communities, through coaching, through online support. 
Ruler is a, a system-wide approach that involves all stakeholders in the education of children, school, teachers, staff, learning professionals. It provides a common language for social and emotional learning across all grade levels. It is, it, um, this screen is incredibly small, which is why we all stumble when we look at it, just so you know. Um, it's implemented with the goals of creating both engaging learning environments and lasting results. And it has been implemented successfully into hundreds of public schools, charter, independent, private, and boarding schools, um, and Catholic schools across the globe. We had Roger speak first, so you already know what CASEL is. Uh, Ruler is a CASEL Select program. It focuses on positive social, emotional, and cognitive development. It extends existing character education, bullying, and conflict resolution programs. And what we do is we teach the core foundational skills that are needed um, that children can take with them and build the foundation for um, choosing not to engage in bullying behavior and developing empathy for others so they don't choose to bully others and they know how to manage conflict effectively. It aligns with the common core state standards and behavioral support systems that many schools are now required to adopt. And it integrates into all context areas of the academic curriculum. This is not a standalone program. It is not something that is taught Tuesdays at 2 o'clock. It's integrated into every single thing a teacher does throughout the entire school day and all the interactions they have. Our theory of change for Ruler is that we have a professional development program and approach for, for teachers and for school leaders. We have a curriculum and classroom activities and instructional tools for classrooms. And then we also work with family members. Our goal is to enhance the social and emotional skills of the children and the adults who are involved in their education, and to enhance the emotional climate in school, in the classrooms, and at home. And we do this with the goal of enhancing the academic engagement of children and their ability to achieve, to help them create better lasting quality relationships so that they engage in less bullying and aggressive behavior, and so that they can build better health, make better choices, and have stronger well-being across their lives. We do this through many different sets of instructional tools, including the charter, which is a, an agreement that's created by all members of a community, so all of the children in a classroom. This is something they design themselves. They identify the feelings that they want to feel when they're learning uh, from their teachers and working together, respected and supported, safe, happy, curious, and they identify the behaviors that they can engage in so that they help their, their peers to experience these feelings and that their peers know how to help them create those feelings in themselves. The charter also helps them outline how can, we be, how can we handle conflict when that arises? How can we do this in a way so that we can continue to feel supported and cared for and respected and curious together? The mood meter is our tool to build emotional awareness. Um, it is a very simple grid of four different colors, but the number of activities you can do with this tool are endless. Just ask Mark to identify five, tool, five ways to use it, and he'll tell you a million. And I kid you not. The meta moment is a, is a process created by Robin Stern and Mark that helps us identify who our best self is, to envision who our best self is as a teacher, as a student, as a colleague, as a child. And it teaches us how to envision that when we are triggered by a strong emotion. So when we're fighting with our spouse, when we're disgruntled by a coworker, how do we want to behave in that situation? What are the strategies we can engage in so that we don't scream back at the person, but we take a deep breath, we vision our best selves, and we behave in the way that will allow that person to remember us that way and for our own self to remember us that way as well in that situation. And then the blueprint is our um, conflict resolution tool that while it helps um, individuals involved in a conflict to resolve that conflict effectively, it does so in the service of building empathy for the other person and the other perspective. And the feeling words curriculum, and this is the root of our program, embeds into academic instruction a rich feelings vocabulary into the academic curriculum so that learning is deeper it's more engaged and it's longer lasting, and so that children develop a rich emotion vocabulary to communicate their thoughts and ideas and their feelings. So the effectiveness of RULER. So we examined the effectiveness of RULER through a randomized control trial and we showed 
when we looked at classrooms using Ruler, that they were more effective. They were more emotionally supportive, they were better organized, time was managed better, behavior was managed better. Among students in Ruler classrooms, they performed better academically, they were less anxious and depressed, they managed their emotions more effectively, um, they were rated as having greater social skills and leadership skills, and they experienced fewer attention problems, fewer learning problems, um, and fewer conduct problems. Ruler is currently being implemented in schools across the United States and Canada and spanning the globe from Australia to Europe to the Arctic. And since 2005, we um, have worked with over 500 schools to implement Ruler and train their teachers and their leaders and their students. And we believe that we have improved the lives of more than 500,000 children and their families. And our goal over the next five years, and we invite you to join us, um, is to enrich the lives of one million more children with our work. And because you've been listening to speakers for the last hour or so, um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to see the children and the teachers who are using Ruler in their classrooms. So let's see if this will work. taking it to the kids and saying, how do you want to feel in this classroom? What are the feelings that you would like to feel every day as you come to learn? We did start off by saying, rather than doing rules, we want to talk about how we want to feel in the classroom. And Kelly actually made a point of saying, we as teachers did this, just so you know, we've, we've already done this. And then we asked them to, as a table group, share what each of those feelings were and come to a consensus about five words for their table. It's a very interesting discussion about the combination of words like serene, comfortable, peaceful. We had one boy who is very reticent, and he defended peaceful. I mean, he really wanted peaceful. Then they voted and they said that comfortable was the word that most fit what they wanted to feel. We, the fourth graders of 4KL, will work together to create a learning environment where every student feels confident, engaged, respected, safe, and comfortable. The second uh, step in creating our class charter was talking about, okay, if these are the feelings that we as a class want to feel every day as teachers, as students, as a community, then what are the behaviors that we would see that would help us feel these things? And so we brainstormed, what would, it, what would it look like to see somebody engaged in the classroom? We feel confident, engaged, respected, safe, and comfortable when we participate in all aspects of the class. We act kindly and support each other when we make mistakes, share our thoughts and feelings appropriately, and keep our confidence. What does it mean to you to be safe in the classroom or to feel respected in the classroom? or to be engaged. What does that actually mean? What does it look like to you? That um, people are supporting your ideas. Oh. And how do, you, how do they do that? What, what happens? Like, um, they nod their head. I wouldn't feel safe or comfortable if somebody was gossiping, gossiping about me or saying something that wasn't true. I wouldn't feel comfortable. I want to feel confident to try to answer a math problem, but without and if I do mess up without people laughing at me. The third step in creating the charter was how we as a class were going to respond when students weren't feeling this way. One of the students came up with, said, well, there should be an apology if there's a problem. And somebody else said, it's got to be a genuine apology. You know? So it was very, I mean, from my, from my perspective, it was absolutely, um, I was in awe that these kids had all that thinking and reflection in them 
and this allowed that to come out. When we do not feel confident, engaged, respected, safe, and comfortable, we will help each other with kindly reminders, be empathetic, and put ourselves in the other person's shoes, talk it out clearly and directly using I statements, offer authentic, meaningful apologies, forgive each other, get help from a teacher when needed. I was surprised by, first how seriously they, they took the whole process. They were very excited uh, to be asked these questions. How do you want to feel? Uh, if we were trying to craft the best year that we could, how do you want to feel at the end of this year? How do you want to feel every day as you come into the classroom? We had very little to say in the conversation, which was exactly what we wanted. We just let it go, and they all came up with that. And they, there were no arguments. There were discussions, but there were no arguments. So I guess I was just surprised at the level of um, how much the, the idea intrigued them and how much they went for it and owned it in a way that I, did, I guess I didn't expect. Respected meant a lot to me because if I don't feel respected, I don't think I will feel really any of the other feelings at all because then I wouldn't feel safe and I wouldn't feel comfortable and I definitely wouldn't feel confident. So that word definitely, I think, means the most to me. And everything we do, we will strive to treat everyone the way we ourselves would want to be treated. Thank you. So educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Thank you very much. So before we start uh, our next presentation, I want to introduce Robin Stern, who is the Associate Director of the Center, and she's going to take us through the last few presentations. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I want to extend a second welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming and joining us today. I'm happy to introduce the next three speakers, who will be telling us about two topics that we've spent a lot of time paying attention to in the last two years. The first is bullying prevention for young people. And the second is creativity and the arts. We've come to realize that emotional intelligence can provide a wider lens and a more holistic perspective on how we approach these issues. So first, I'd like to welcome Diana DeVice. Diana is a research affiliate in our center who has really deepened our thinking about bullying prevention by bringing to us her lens of child development and her expertise and passion as well. Diana will talk to us today about the need to bring this critical lens of child development to the national stage as we address the epidemic of bullying in America. Diana? Good afternoon, everyone. America started taking bullying seriously uh, after Columbine about 15 years ago. Yet the day that I sat down to start thinking about this talk, a young boy in Greenwich, Connecticut went home after school. He was 15, uh, gentle, tall, had a little bit of acne, and a, a soft Polish accent. He went home and fatally shot himself uh, after years of being bullied. A short time later, a girl in Florida, you probably saw the headlines, uh, jumped off of a tower after being bullied. And another girl uh, hanged herself in her bathroom while her mom was in another room. So how can this still be happening? And why have we not moved the needle on bullying? Here at the center, 
we believe in fewer rules and more feelings to finally begin to seriously address bullying. So bullying is intentional harm that is repeated and involves a power imbalance. It can be uh, direct, physical and verbal. It can be indirect, harming relationships or reputations. Or it can be cyber, bullying through social media. There are multiple roles involved. The, the bully tends to have some kind of perceived power. Maybe he or she accrues a, a social following or maybe is athletic, has some high status of some sort. The uh, victim tends to have, uh, tends to be perceived of as different in some way. And, um, and often struggles a little bit socially. Bully victims are those kids who are both bullied and turn to bullying others. And bullying almost always takes place in the context of witnesses. Um, Bystanders may collude with the bully, or more often than not, they just don't know what to do. And uh, upstanders are those few kids who will jump in and try to do something about the situation. This is not a small problem. About two-thirds of kids uh, report being bullied at some point. A third of kids have been bullied at some point in the last six months. And a small percentage experiences chronic, ongoing, intense peer abuse. Bullying tends to peak in the middle school years and decline uh, through the grades uh, through high school. And the consequences are serious. The, um, the outcomes of, uh, sorry, this, this is very difficult to see on here. <laughs> um, the symptoms associated with being bullied tem tend to cluster around uh, trauma and now we know from uh, data that's, thank you, data that's come out in 2013 in a couple of uh, longitudinal studies that the, those symptoms of trauma last into adulthood. The symptoms associated with being uh, a bully, as bullies are not immune to the ill effects either. They often suffer from anxiety, depression, use alcohol, and um, their symptoms tend to cluster around uh, antisocial behavior. The prognosis for being a, a, a bully victim is the worst of all. Those kids are the most aggressive and they have the most difficult challenges later in life. Uh, they're involved in uh, illegal behavior, they have psychiatric issues, employment problems, and a lot of problems with social relations. We don't have long-term data on bystanders, but we do know that they are very often anxious and insecure. Uh, one study showed that in the laboratory when bystanders were shown videos of uh, bullying scenarios, that their, the social pain processing centers of their brains lit up and uh, were very active, especially for empathic teens. And one, another study uh, with college students showed that when they talked about their experiences of witnessing abuse when they were kids, that their symptoms of trauma were equal to trauma experienced by emergency workers in disasters. So for anyone who might still believe that bullying somehow prepares you for adulthood and is something that normal that everybody has to go through, this longitudinal data that has come out shows convincingly, overwhelmingly, that bullying actually undermines the ability to master adult tasks. Every state but Montana has some kind of bullying policy or legislation, which means that just about every school in the country has some kind of bullying prevention program in place. So what do these programs look like? Most are based on the OAS uh, bully prevention program out of Norway. That program uh, focuses primarily on uh, monitoring, enforcing, consequences, discipline. It's a very uh, discipline-oriented uh, approach. So initially in Norway, that approach met with uh, good success. It was, uh, they had uh, a significant impact. But three major studies around the country in America have shown that the program has not uh, 
translated. So we don't get the same positive effects here in America that they did initially. So other programs might take a zero tolerance approach, uh, but the American Psychological Association has determined uh, absolutely that these programs are not effective. In fact, they create collateral damage. Uh, they increase behavior. They uh, disproportionately focus on students of color, and uh, they increase uh, dropout rates. Other programs might clip on components to a, a general disciplinary approach. So other programs might, in addition, uh, encourage kids to intervene as uh, upstanders, or they might, uh, the schools might teach empathy or conflict resolution, that sort of thing. So how's that going? Basically, the bullying incidence rates have just flatlined at around 27% uh, over a six-year period. And six meta-analyses have shown that, uh, have concluded that there is little to no impact on bullying of these bully prevention programs. And this past spring, I attended a conference where uh, Dorothy Espelage, who is the, one of the leading researchers in the field, concluded her session, which had been called Four Decades of Bullying Prevention, What Have We Learned, with this comment. Yeah, a little disheartening. So what are bully prevention programs missing? First, we think a one-size-fits-all approach isn't going to work for everyone. Kids are different. It would be easy to teach, for example, a high-status, extroverted kid to be an upstander, but you wouldn't do that, and it would be clinically appropriate, uh, inappropriate to do that for a kid who is uh, shy and flooded with stress hormones. Oops, sorry. Second, uh, child development matters. Kids have different abilities and vulnerabilities at different ages, and recent research in neuroscience shows that beginning at around age 13, kids develop an incredible sensitivity to their social environment. They get more stressed, they feel more judged, they feel worse when they're ostracized or excluded, and they can make more dangerous decisions in social situations. At the same time, we see this behaviorally, we see this in neuroimaging studies. Adolescents show more activation in the emotion processing centers of their brain uh, compared to children and compared to adults um, when they're in social situations. So there's something very unique and important about the developing neuroarchitecture of, uh, of the adolescent, and we should be engaging with that constructively. Third, as researcher Larry Steinberg says, um, we don't punish infants because they can't walk or talk. Similarly, in, instead of punishing unwanted behavior in adolescence, we should be engaging with this heightened social sensitivity constructively, and the earlier the better. So you've heard from Susan, thank you Susan, um, about the ruler approach and its benefits and the tools that are grounded in emotion and developmental theory. And as she showed you, early research on uh, ruler has already shown that when kids are learn to, when kids learn to recognize, understand, label, express, and regulate emotion, there's less anxiety, less aggression, the whole school community draws closer together, and there's better social problem solving. And this is, of course, consistent with the findings that Roger um, described in the meta-analyses. So what makes RULER different from bullying prevention programs? First of all, as Susan described, RULER spends about two years training the adults before even rolling it out with the kids. Adults can only teach what they know, and imagine if uh, there's a focus on uh, being empathic in the classroom, but a student sees a teacher dysregulated with another teacher, there's a disconnect. And one of my colleagues says, kids are like emotional Geiger counters. They pick up everything. And a lot of emotion work is implicit, not explicit. So we adults need to be consistent. Second, as Mark is fond of saying, we train everybody with a face from the bus driver to the superintendent to the parents. This makes sense both in theory and in practice. The tighter and more redundant the network, 
uh, is around the child, the more likely the child will internalize those skills. And this is not a top-down approach. This is more of an inside-to-outside approach. That is, the shy child can choose a strategy that's different than the extroverted child, that's different than the child that's having a bad day, that's different than the child in the wheelchair or the one with ADD. The, the solutions are located in the child, him or herself. And by building those process skills, the solutions remain child-centered and therefore highly differentiated. The good news is that the approach works. The not so good news is that it's very um, labor intensive and time consuming, uh, but it's about um, that slow process of cultivating emotional maturity in an entire school. So let's get granular for a minute and look at how a ruler school would feel different to children uh, in the bullying scenario. So for children who might be a bully, first of all, as Susan described, the charter creates new norms that the children have signed on to themselves. They've generated how they want to feel in a classroom, what behaviors they need to engage in to support those feelings, and what to do when things go off the rails. So all the kids have uh, signed on to that. And I like to say that uh, that sort of work, um, that building emotion skills in that way in a classroom is like enhancing an immune system. The whole ecology is healthier, and if disease does crop up, it's uh, not as severe and not as long-lasting. Kids obviously spend a lot of time uh, coming to understand their feelings and developing self-awareness. But one of the key th uh, things for bullies is that um, for kids who bully because of uh, maltreatment in the home, for example, we know from research that they misinterpret very often other people's feelings. So the group work that's done around the feeling words curriculum help these kids perceive other people's feelings accurately, and that's very important. Of course, the meta moment helps kids self-regulate and choose the best strategies, and the blueprint fosters appropriate interpersonal problem solving. For children who might be bullied, the environment is more supportive. They can more easily recruit help from peers. Teachers are more aware, more, we say, attuned to their kids, so um, the teacher will be engaged with the child helping with unique and particular challenges. They also develop more self-awareness so that, for example, when they feel anxiety arising, rather than avoid, which is probably one of the most popular defense mechanisms or strategies, they can recognize the feeling that's arising in them as a signal to perhaps uh, go get help or whatever strategy that they have um, talked about and thought about. And for witnesses, the charter has created a greater accountability. There's less stigma and less fear around jumping in, helping out, participating. And their individual strategies are respected as well. So the bold child can feel free to jump in and intervene, and the shy child might uh, know that she has to take a meta moment calm the arousal, breathe, and then take a more um, sideways strategy of maybe asking a friend to help or, or getting help from an adult. So we're excited about advancing the science of how this universal emotion skills training program can impact children's developmental trajectories in general and bullying in particular. So for example, we want to know specifically how does Ruler help the key players in the bullying scenario. Uh, if, if Ruler is adopted by an entire cohort, uh, that is kids from pre-K to 12 get uh, a Ruler training, then what will that developmental arc look like and can we alter that emotion dysregulation in the middle period? What specific aspects of ruler are critical at which developmental moments? And of course, uh, what are the long-term effects into adulthood of ruler training? We're not so narcissistic as to think that this will work for everybody. So we're interested in looking at uh, what would more focused intervention look like for kids who continue to struggle. So we've taken it as a fact in education that if we teach kids strategies in math, science, English, uh, we can teach them just about anything, as long as, it's, as long as those strategies are delivered in an age-appropriate way. 
So I like to say that in the case of emotions, we've not yet begun to exploit the power of the frontal cortex where the strategies live to manage the subcortical regions where the emotion processing happens. So we look forward to finally moving the needle on bullying, helping children in pain get relief, as well as developing skills in all children in order that they might flourish and unfurl the talent and potential that is in each one of them. Thank you. Part of being emotionally intelligent is having the stamina to sit through these uh, presentations. So we're testing, we're filming you right now to make sure that you have those skills. Thank you, Diana. That was really wonderful and inspiring. Um, next, we'll hear from Arturo Behar who is a new friend of the center. And while Arturo would describe himself as one of the directors of engineering at Facebook, we think of him as the director of engineering at Facebook. Arturo is spearheading the anti-bullying initiative at Facebook, which is a collaboration now between our team here at Yale and our colleagues at Berkeley. And over the last two years, we've co-developed new ways of helping teens to cope with unpleasant experiences. You're, you're giving away <laughs> his whole talk. <laughs> Close your eyes. <laughs> We've co-developed new ways of helping teens cope with unpleasant experiences and bullying online. Arturo will tell us today how we've integrated emotional intelligence into Facebook reporting systems and I'll talk about the results of our experiments, which demonstrate over and over the power of emotional intelligence to promote pro-social engagement between teens. Before Arturo begins, I just want to say that this has been a really unique collaboration. It started out initially with Arturo and his team, the people who have expertise in knowing where kids live and knowing how kids connect, and Mark, the research scientist with a great sense of humor <laughs> and expect expertise in academics and scientific rigor, and myself, a practicing psychoanalyst with expertise in clinical work. And as we work together in our emotionally intelligent and fruitful collaboration, the project grew and is now a key focus of our center's research in bullying. Thank you. Arturo? Thank you very much. Uh, I hope to not talk too fast. Um, when I was at my son's school uh, reading um, a couple of years ago, um, one of the kids, the, his friends was there, raised his hand, and I'm like, yes. And he's like, Jordi, that's my son's name, um, does your dad speak English? Um, <laughs> and my son got up to me, gave me a big hug, and said, well, you know, he tries. Um, <laughs> So anyhow, so it, it's very exciting for me to be today, and sort of huge props to Mark and Robin and Susan and the team and all of that for, for what's getting started or the, the point in the journey where we're at today. Uh, how I came to this was uh, fairly um, weird. Um, I started working at Facebook, first dealing with all of the systems that protect all the people who use Facebook. And as part of that, I got entrusted the team that supports the people who use Facebook. So you have an issue, you hit report, it comes to us, um, and... Um, and we're looking at the reports, and it didn't make any sense. We're looking at the reports for harassment, we're looking at the picture, and it just, just thought like that. Drug use, nudity, and we're looking at the things that they're, they're not making any sense. We're looking at reports for bullying, and again, the things are not connecting with each other until we realized that most of the images that were getting reported to Facebook uh, were reported by the person in the image. And in most cases, the person who had uploaded the picture was one of their friends. And the two tools we gave them to deal with this was comment in, all of, in front of all of your friends, which is the moral equivalent of, hey, everybody look at me in this picture, or report to Facebook and use whatever mechanisms were available there. And so at that time, we began meeting people that were doing, uh, studying the science of emotion and um, how emotion gets communicated and emotional intelligence. 
And I, I realized there were so many people that we wanted to hear from that we just put a day together with the help of um, Catherine, uh, who's here. Um, big props, because she's uh, in part uh, responsible for this relationship. And I asked her, so who would be like the best person to talk about uh, bullying? And she said, oh, there's this guy, he just did a TEDx and he's totally awesome sauce. She might not have used the word awesome sauce. <laughs> um, and, and it was Mark and he came over at Facebook and he gave a talk and at the end of that day between Mark um, and uh, Dacher Kelton from Berkeley, those were people that we wanted to establish partnerships. And so I went up to them and told them, okay, so what would you say if I told you we have six months to come up with something, build it, get data for it, iterate on it, and then study it, and then publish findings for it. Um, yeah. Um, but that's what we did. We, we set out together, and, and we, we started on two pathways that have now converged. And the first one, which I learned from a marketing team, is that um, you know the age really mattered. We started with 13 to 14 year olds, um, and when you look at this, look at this in the context of any kids that you have, or any friends that you have kids that are on Facebook or online. And we found that many interesting things. Mark has put together these focus groups, and Charlie's also here has helped with a lot of these things. Uh, and we asked them, so what's going on? And the first thing that came up is, you know, if I click the word report, I'm worried I'm going to get my friends in trouble. So how would you talk about it? Well, it, this post is a problem. This photo is a problem. We changed the language from report. And by the way, every legislator, everybody will tell you report. You have to have a big red report button. We changed the language to this post is a problem. We'll show the numbers in a little bit. We tripled the number of people coming in through the report flows. We, we went from what happened to how are you feeling and what can you do about this? We talked to them and they wanted tools so they could deal with the issues for themselves. Um, and they felt that if the steps they took were meaningful, that they would complete them because they were to the service of the flow. Now, a lot of the things we have found throughout this project contradict everything they will teach you in computer science or computer design, where it says use the least amount of language possible, use the least number of steps possible. Everything we do is the opposite of that and it seems to be working really well. And one of the biggest lessons we learned is the importance of language. Harassing me, like, what does that mean to a 13 or 14 year old? Instead, said mean things about me resonates. And when Mark took this to, 15, uh, to uh, 14, uh, 15 and 16 year olds, it was about respect. They disrespected me. And that's the language that works. So how happens, how do we apply this? this? So a big part of it is we have to recognize that at Facebook we're supporting two different constituents that are very different from each other. One of them is annoyance and uh, something that's kind of bothersome and you don't like it, but it's really not such a big deal. And then on the other extreme, you have people who feel intensely afraid or intensely um, uh, ashamed or there's the, the very strong emotions that come. And what we have to do is we have to account for both of these things. So we ask people how the, uh, how the post or the photo makes them feel. We ask them to select an emotion and then we ask them the intensity of the emotion and we tailor the flows according uh, to the answers they give us. And then the other thing we do is we empower the taking of positive and safe actions, both on and offline, because really the online-offline distinction is one that we make more than they make by a country mile. For us, it's different worlds. For them, it's one life, one set of people, one set of interactions in different contexts. Uh, and we did this through, through doing positive priming and using pre-populated messages. So what does the flow look like? Um, we have this thing where you're reporting this photo, and notice the use of language. I would like to, uh, this photo to be removed from Facebook because I just don't like it. It's harmful and might affect my reputation. That's really how they talk about bullying. If it bullies me, that doesn't work as well as this kind of language. It shouldn't be allowed on Facebook. It breaks some of the Facebook rules or it's spam because we now, we found out everybody's really good about flagging spam. So how does this photo make you feel? Afraid, angry, embarrassed, sad, None of the above, so we can get more data. How afraid are you? Slightly, a little, moderately, quite a bit, extremely. And again, the purpose of this is to figure out where they're at, but there's something else that's going on here that we think plays into the flows, which is they're getting a moment to pause and assess how it is that they're feeling about the interaction that they're having, and, and they've given it a name, and it's now there, and then you take them to the set of actions that they can take. So what actions can they take? So send a message to someone they trust. By the way, this used to be send a message to an adult that you trust. Turns out most teens turn to older teenagers as the people they trust to help them navigate these class of issues. Um, send a message to the, where appropriate, send a message to the person who uploaded the content because sometimes that's the best way to resolve the situation given some constructive language. Also just step away from the computer and reach out to somebody that you trust. You, ha you have language that we put in the messages that they can edit, but we provide some positive language. Hey, Jake, I don't like this photo because it's inappropriate. Would you please take it down? 
And then the other thing we put throughout is this kind of acknowledgement. We're talking with Robin, and this we'll learn from Robin, to make this kind of a conversation that you would be having should you be sitting with a teenager in the circumstance. It makes sense that you're feeling afraid. We're sorry that you had this experience, right? And having this kind of feeling, a conversational feeling to the flow, we felt was very important to guide people. Now, the other really cool thing about this is we have data. We have lots and lots of data. And a number that uh, Mark hasn't heard before, uh, which I wanted to um, take out today, is that these flows that we crafted together touch uh, 150,000 lives a week, 150,000 unique people. Um, and they use it more than once, so this is really nice numbers. Um, and so we have lots of data, and with the data we hope to move the field forward, and, we've, and we're doing a partnership where we're going to look at the data and figure out what is it that the data has to tell us about what's really going on out there. So we found this photo is a problem. Most of the time, you know, I just want to untag myself, it's spam, very lightweight interactions. You have to, when we look at these things, there's an emotional spectrum that we're dealing with. I would like this photo to be removed from Facebook most of the time. It's because I just don't like it. And notice the gender differences. Most of this, for 13 to 14 year olds, girls more than boys. But there is a really important, it's harmful and might affect my reputation. That is the instance of what we would call bullying. People are worried about the impact that's going to have on their lives. If we look at we just don't like it, um, uh, most of it is people say it's, it's a bad photo of me. Um, and on average, 60% um, uh, of kids send messages to content creators. When we first built these flows, we had an empty message box, and uh, only 20% of uh, people would be sending messages to each other. And uh, most of the messages were something along the lines of, hey, bitch, I love you, I hate you, XOXO, smiley face. <laughs> and I redacted the language on that one. Um, Girls are more likely than boys to send messages for bad or, or embarrassing photos. What else do we find about photos? In the case of it's harmful and might affect uh, reputation, embarrassment is the most important emotion there. Right? And, and you think about it, you put yourself in that age, embarrassing is something that's really important. And by the way, when, when, we, when we send messages between people, sometimes when you ask the person to take the content down, we found that the response is very telling. We don't, the, the right metric on this is not whether the photo comes down, but whether the photo comes down or a dialogue initiates with the person who uploaded the content when it's appropriate to reach out to them. Because we saw lots of instances where people come, would come back and say, hey, you look amazing in that photo. I'm really sorry that you feel bad about it. Or, you know, it's my grandmother's favorite photo of me, so I'm not going to take it down. But that kind of dialogue is very important. And if there's any big hope overriding all of this work, is that if you provide these little interactions in this social, social emotional spectrum that help people resolve issues positively with each other, that they'll develop the skills that will help them deal with other circumstances. But back to the data. So embarrassment, most frequently experienced emotion, um, and results in more messaging compared to all other emotions. And girls, by a ratio of seven to three, are more likely than boys to send messages. And we need to dig into that because we need to figure out whether it's like developmental or whether it's gender, whether we could change the experience to accommodate um, gender issues. There's a lot of work we need to do. What else did we find? So we found that there's a really nice correlation between emotion intensity um, and, and the messaging rate. Messaging is a good thing. Messaging is somebody reaching out to somebody else to deal with the issues. And very importantly, 84% of kids use our pre-populated positive messages, um, which, have been, which, which we have shown to have good sentiment between the different parties involved. So we think that everything we're doing is working really well. So what else did we learn? So it turns out that for this flow that is multiple steps, you see how many screens it is, completion rate is very high, it's up to 80%, which is really quite wonderful. And the time spent in the flow is longer to get into the service of what we're doing. If people just want to untag, works well. Blocking used to be a default thing, but blocking on Facebook is not really the right resolution because uh, how blocking works is you disappear from each other on the site, and you really can't do that in school. Uh, so we, un we made that an option, but it's not the default option, and, and the block rate dropped uh, a bunch. Reported content tripled, and messaging content creator grew also significantly. And this is, these are all things that demonstrate that we're on the right path. We saw similar results in blocking uh, for the post flow. So post is when people do a status update that is text. And um, the, the other one is um, the photos flows. And we saw similar where we like double the reporting of content, we um, more than double the messaging the content creator by using these kinds of principles. And one of the things that's important about this, and this goes back to an experience I had with my son, is I was with him on, the, on, a, on a rock climbing uh, event with a bunch of his friends. And one of the boys, Ben, got stuck in the middle of the wall. And he was like struggling there. And all the kids came up to me and said, hey, hey, can you please take up your phone and take a video of that? And so I took out my phone and I took a video of that. And as soon as I put my phone down, all of the boys around me were going, can you please send me the video? Can you please send me the video? And I stopped and I said, well, what does Ben think about that? I'll send you the video if Ben is OK with me sending the video. 
And I asked Ben, Ben, would you want to send me? And Ben was like, no way. And all of the boys dissipated on their own. As we go online, this kind of feedback loop that people have with each other about what's good and bad behavior is missing. And so building out these mechanisms that help people uh, not only communicate when they liked or commented or loved something, but they commit to communicate to each other when it was embarrassing or when it was another kind of emotions, we hope that taps into the fact that you know most people don't intend to hurt each other. Most people don't intend to, to be uh, dealing with these kinds of circumstances and they need to be made aware of what's going on. The same way that we need to figure out the flows where there is that kind of intent to harm and figure out what is the right solution for that set of people as we've made a lot of progress on as part of our flows. Um, so um, I'm just, uh, we, we talked about most of these things. I'm just gonna skip through this and I'm gonna jump ahead to what the future holds. Um, so there's a big area of work that we need to be doing. One of them is to understand whether these flows are indeed serving the people that we're here to support. Because we, we're, it's easy to get answers for them right as the event is happening. You go away a day and we need to reach out to them in a meaningful way and say, this is work for you, this is work for you for the trusted person who reached out to. Did your situation get addressed or resolved? Because I think from that we're gonna learn new things that we have to develop and work on. We need to better understand the role of intent and perception because one of the things that's most important about this is if I were to put up on this wall 50 of the posts that were most loved and 50 of the posts that were reported for the most aggressive of bullying, you would not be able to tell the difference. Teasing language, um, you're a jerk, you're an idiot. Sometimes it's received well if it's between friends and it's intentional. You look amazing today, your sweater was beautiful, can be the most mean thing you can tell to somebody else who's feeling bad about their image. So we're having to deal with issues of what's the intent of the poster when they're uploading the content and what's the perception of the person as they receive it and how you can connect those two with each other. And the last one, which is something I'm incredibly excited about, is we've been working at, uh, for these six months with um, uh, Robin and Mark and team because th there's so many places where you say, well, if your children are in a bullying situation, you should have a conversation with them. And everybody talks about having the conversation, but nobody has a script for the conversations. And we talked to lots of people about this. So we're gonna make this, we worked on this together, we're gonna make this available through Facebook as part of the flow, a script that if you're a parent, here's things you do, here's the things you don't do, here's questions you can use, a script for the person who's helping, and to give people the kind of tools and language that they can be using to navigate the circumstances with each other, which is really kind of at the center of our mission as a company, as well as the work that we're doing in partnership with Mark. So anyhow, very happy to be here. Thank you for hearing me out. And One more to go. You can sit through it. I promise you we're ending on a nice... Refreshing area of research. Thank you, Arturo. Very exciting. Next, I'd like to introduce Zorana Ivchevich Pringle. Did I say it right? Zorana is a research scientist at our center who got her PhD with Jack Mayer Jack Mayer co-developed the theory of emotional intelligence with Peter Salovey. Just a few minutes ago, you heard Mark talk about share our mission and vision with us, with you as a large group. A big part of our mission is about the role of emotional intelligence in helping individuals be as productive as they can be. So in this spirit, we're very excited to hear Sarana share with us the new research on the role of emotions and emotional intelligence in creativity. Thank you. Hello, everyone. For the last talk today, we're gonna talk about something a little bit different. So, so far, you have learned that emotional intelligence skills matter and matter for a lot of different outcomes. They matter for health, and psychological well-being, they matter for school success, uh, they matter for school climate, a lot of different outcomes in interpersonal and health domains. But we're gonna shift gears a little bit right now and talk about how these skills matter for creativity and effectiveness in what we do in our daily tasks. I want to start, get us started with a bricklayer and a statistic. The top 10% of earners, according to the US Census report, make four times more than the bottom 10% of earners. Why is that? Well, 
leaving aside some gross economic uh, factors. I think that uh, part of the story is creativity. There are basic bricklayers and then the artisanal bricklayers. There's a difference. Those jobs that require independent thinking, that require solving problems, that require creativity are better paid. And those are the jobs of the future that we oftentimes hear about. So part of our mission is to figure out what should we do? How can we make our students and our children prepared for these jobs of the future, these theoretical jobs of the future? And I'm going to argue that we need to do two things. One is that we need to make them want to be creative, make them aware of the importance of creativity, make them more willing to be creative in what they do. And the second is give them those skills that will prepare them, give them the resources to deal with the ups and downs of creativity. The first thing that most of us think of when we hear, hear word creativity is art. And art takes us on an emotional roller coaster from sadness, relaxation, anguish, depression, but artistic creativity is not the only kind of creativity that is full with emotion. Invention and innovation is full of emotion too. And there are, there's joy, elation in having an idea, being inspired, achieving something. But also in the same time, there's the daily frustration. There is occasional desperation when things are just not going the way you want them to go or the way that you think they're supposed to go. And indeed, psychologists have long been interested in the relationship between emotions and creativity. For several decades, psychologists, social psychologists in particular, have asked the question, which emotions enhance creativity? In which emotional states people have to be to be more creative? So they did experiments. They brought people into the lab and set up experiments that look something like this. They would induce moods, like Peter talked about uh, earlier today, by having people listen to upbeat music or gloomy music, or think of personally meaningful experience from people's lives that were sad or happy or have different emotional valence. And once they did that, once they were feeling emotions associated with these things, then they asked them, uh, they gave them a task, a test that looked, well, maybe something like this. What is this, you say? These O's, these little circles, it's a creativity test. And this creativity test has a task. You have to finish these drawings. You are told these are unfinished drawings. You have to finish them any way that you want by incorporating these, well, zeros or, or little circles. And when people get going, you, get an ending, uh, you end up with something like this. It's a creativity test. It's a laboratory creativity test. And with several decades of research of this sort, uh, researchers concluded positive moods, happy moods, enhance creativity. When people are put in happy moods, they create more of these little drawings, and these drawings are more original. So what do you think right now? If I am able to read your mind at all, you might be thinking that well, what about all those scientists and all those artists who cannot exactly be described as upbeat, cheery, happy people, right? Well, you would be right. The question and the situation is a little bit more complex. These experiments tell us that positive emotions can indeed enhance creativity. They in particular enhance one specific aspect of creativity, creative idea generation under the specific circumstance when you are given already a problem, a task, specific task, like do these drawings with these set of instructions. In real life, it doesn't quite happen like that. Creativity, as the creators of Facebook, does not really happen in that way. It happens in a different way. It happens that people have to figure out which problems are worth pursuing. They have to find problems. They have to realize what are the needs of people in society. And then they have to work on generating ideas. They have to evaluate these ideas, figure out which ones are the best. And once they figure that out, they have to execute these ideas. 
So it is a really complex process, and we're only starting to scratch the surface on what is really going on there. So here in our work, we take a different approach. We put this upside down, and uh, we ask a different question. Instead of asking what moods, what emotions enhance creativity, we ask the question of how can different moods, how can different emotions be harnessed in the service of creativity? There is a fundamental assumption here that people have agency. People have agency to influence the course of their emotions, and people also have agency to influence the course of their creative process. Both of those are very important. The first thing that people have to do is decide whether they want to be creative in the first place, whether they want to attempt being creative. In our studies with college students and with high school students, we have created questionnaires, surveys, asking people about their emotional experience surrounding the creative process and thinking about creativity. And we did the factor analysis, these fancy statistical techniques. We found three factors of attitudes about creativity. One is anticipated negative social consequences of being creative and being original. We can summarize, that, summarize it as people think original ideas are silly. There might be negative consequences for me if I share my creative ideas. People might think, people might ridicule me or um, they might punish me. The second one is Summarized as well, better to be safe than original, better to, to be safe than sorry. For all of us who have ever taught, uh, this is when a student asks you, what do I have to do? What specific steps do I have to follow in order to get an A? They are trying to avoid any risk. And creativity is full with, full with risk. The third kind of attitude is more open to creativity. And this attitude is, well, creativity projects feel important, feel meaningful to me. So the first task that we have to do is change people's attitudes towards these ones. And um, indeed, when people have these attitudes, when students have these attitudes, they have more positive motivation for uh, project-based learning, these long-lasting projects that require creativity, and they are willing to work on them with more sustained effort, put, put more into them. The second question is, well, sometimes it happens that people have creative ideas, but they don't do anything with them. Nothing ever happens. How do we deal with that? And in our research, we started with a hypothesis. We are researchers here, and our hypothesis was that Emotion skills provide resources that enable people to deal with um, those ups and downs in the creative process. And in our work with uh, high school students, we ask them, who are your most creative peers? Nominate them, tell us who they are. And they did that, they also completed a lot of other measures of creative potential, and we found that those students with highest creative potential who also had high emotion skills were those who were nominated most often. So emotional intelligence skills made a difference between having creative potential, having those, that openness and willingness to participate in creativity, and actually achieving it. But being scientists, we wanted to see how this happens. So we wanted to see what is this process like? How do we go from emotional intelligence to creative achievement? And we found that emotional intelligence is a resource for people to persist and work sustainably on these projects they have. People with more emotional intelligence had more persistence, and because of this persistence, they were able to achieve more creatively. Right now, we are building a model to describe emotion skills and creativity. And here we start with an assumption, well, you first have to have creativity-relevant skills, such as being open to experiences, being curious, being inquisitive, and original in thinking. And you need to have domain-specific skills. If you're going to be an architect, you better have some spatial ability. But then there's that unnerving process of facing a black canvas, facing a black computer, blank computer screen, 
Then you have to come up with ideas, evaluate those ideas, you have to execute uh, what your idea is, and this whole process is fraught with emotion. But that emotion can be used in at least two different ways. It can be used as a tool of inspiration, and it can be used as a choice, as a driver of choice on which tasks to work on. Throughout this process, we need emotion regulation. We need to deal with those ups and downs from frustration to elation. And we are doing research right now, working on two different tracks. One is doing basic work to understand the process of using emotions for creativity. And another track is more applied, teaching these skills. So first about our research. We are asking how emotions can be used as tools of inspiration, frustration, can be a signal that there is a problem that might be interesting to explore, but it can also make people give up. What happens, how it happens, who are the people who are actually going to explore those problems. And then um, a second tool, how emotions can be used, is to direct choice. Most of us, at any given point in time, have multiple items on our to-do list, right? Anybody ever hear of that? So this, these are some items on my to-do list. If you happen to be in a somewhat gloomy mood, you are more likely, it comes more easily, to be critical, to be really finding fault at things. Well, if you are in that mood, it will be really beneficial for you to be reviewing and editing your work. You want to be critical about your work, and it's easier to be critical about your work in those states. Next, we want to think big. And our big project is to think big and study eminent creators. In the words of MacArthur Foundation, those are creative individuals with a track record of achievement and the potential for even more significant contributions in the future. These are the recipients of the so-called Genius Awards. We want to study them. We want to see what is different that they do and then use that to teach people to, well, maybe not be geniuses, but be better in, in their lives about it. And finally, in our second track, we want to teach people how to use emotions um, for enhanced creativity. And with this, we are partnering with uh, Fundacion Botin and Botin Center in Spain. Um, and we are using art to teach people how to observe, how to see more first in the works of art, how to see beyond what is obvious, beyond what everybody notices, and use this skill to notice more in their environment, find more problems, explore more problems. We are essentially reverse engineering from observing art to teach people more about the creative process. And to end, I want to leave you with a quote from an artist who you might have heard of. And Picasso said, the artist is a receptacle for emotions that come from all over the place. Artists have an implicit, intimate understanding that they are transforming emotions into works of art. We want to, here at our center, imagine a world where we are going to make people more open to emotions so that not only artists are receptacles for emotions and use them in their creative process, but at least to a greater extent, all of us can do that. Thank you, Zorana. So Zorana have, and I have been colleagues for about uh, 15 years, and notice that she didn't say thank you at the end of her presentation, and that's one of the cultural differences that I've learned from Zorana. She's very humble, she just ends, and we're always like, thank you, don't you think it was great? <laughs> <laughs> so to wrap up today, we're, we're running late, as all of you know. Um, many of you probably have to use the restroom or something like that. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out. You saw we're doing what I think is I hate to use the word groundbreaking, but we are trying to break ground here at Yale by doing unique research, by moving the field forward. And uh, I hope that all of you will like us on Facebook, uh, that all of you will check out our new website, and, uh, and please stay in touch. So thank you so much for coming out. It was wonderful. Thank you.
<clears throat> last